Um, um, mute everybody. I think, I think everybody is, uh, uh, what I would just do is, is give, give Paul a brief welcome and uh, <laughs> say good morning to everybody. I, I, won't, I won't take up too much time. Um, thank, thank everyone for joining us again. It, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it, we try and put on... So, you've muted yourself. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, I'm... Probably missed most of what I had to say. Not, not, not besides welcoming Paul, which is the main thing. But anything else, I'll say. I'll, I'll say a few words at the end about up, uh, upcoming events. But today, it's a pleasure to have Paul with us. Um, has a very strong Asian background. Has lived in Bangkok um, now. I think for probably he's been he's been in he's been in the region for a long time. But he's been in Bangkok. I think for the best part of 20, 25 years. Um, and is in his sort of a uh, acknowledged expert in his own his own field of Thai silver and nillaware, um, and and written several books. Some some we've already seen on the screen today. I'm glad some members have them. But I think what the best thing to do is what I would do is hand the hand the screen over to Paul. We'll go through Paul's uh, uh, presentation. I think keeping unless you've got any burning questions, keep keep any questions and, until the end, and then we can we can go through those, um, and and we can round up then. But rather than me go on any longer. Paul, let me hand the screen over to you. Um, I will mute myself and then uh, look, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you very much, Steve. Can you, can you hear me? Just yes, I, I can, yes. <laughs> okay, I hope everyone else can. Well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to give this uh, talk today. Uh, I'm uh, in my uh, condo in Hin, which is uh, a novel experience uh, giving a Zoom lecture, and um, the topic today is Thai silver and nilaware, which is a passion of mine. Um, as you mentioned, I, I've actually been living in Thailand. This is my second time, uh, and I've been here for just over 23 years, and I've been in Asia for over 35 years, uh, and the rest of the time living in Hong Kong and China. Um, you are, you're all very familiar with Thailand, so I don't need to really say this, but you know, it's, it's pretty sad in my uh, experience that most people uh, only think about Thailand as being a land of you know, sun and sea, massage, good food, and not much else. Maybe a little bit of uh, culture uh, at the temple. Um, and so it was with that in mind that I decided that I wanted to write the book about Thai silver and yellowware because silverware, which I've been collecting for about uh, 20 years and have been interested in for probably 30 years, um, has always been, uh, I think, very beautiful and something that has really been underappreciated by the majority of people who visit the country and indeed outside of Thailand. And it has actually been considered one of the minor arts of Thailand, you know, painting and sculpture being the major arts. And in my view, there is really nothing minor about the minor arts of Thailand. So with that in mind, uh, I decided to write this, uh, write this book. And uh, if I can, yep, yeah, uh, we'll go to the, we'll start the presentation. And please excuse me if I get some of these uh, slides in the wrong order, but uh, this is the first time. So, the first question is really, what is Thai silverware? And, you know, I had to come up with a definition that, that, that worked for me and for the book. And so I, I decided that uh, Thai silverware would be any silver object that was made within the borders of present-day Thailand, regardless of the ethnicity of the silversmith. So in, in other words, I included all of those objects made by Chinese silversmiths. I also included objects made overseas to order that clearly depict Thai forms and or designs. And again, there are a number of those which we'll come to and look at uh, during, the, during the course of the presentation. And the problem that I had when I was trying to uh, define Thai silverware is that there were very, very few examples predating the 18th century. Um, uh, the, and certainly the late 18th century uh, with the destruction of uh, Ayutthaya. And that was because most objects uh, of precious metal, gold or silver, 
were melted down in time of economic need. And not many uh, objects actually did survive from generation to, gener to generation because when a family wanted to have a new uh, silver object made, they would take an old one or they would take some silver coinage to the silversmith to, to get it melted down. So that's really why it's very difficult to, dis to, to, to look for old examples. But then, while just before we came to publishing the book, and we included a picture of this uh, silver jug in the book, this, this silver jug got quite a, a lot of attention in 2019 because it was discovered in the uh, Musée de Versailles collection, and it was hailed as being the oldest uh, surviving piece of Thai silverware. So as a contrarian, uh, I'm including it today, but actually uh, it doesn't meet the definitions, or my definitions of Thai silverware, because to my mind, this present that was given by the Thai ambassadors to King Narai in 1686, is clearly of Chinese design and most likely made by Chinese silversmiths in China and then exported to Thailand because there were not the uh, skilled Chinese silversmiths in Ayutthaya at that time in the 17th century who would have been able to produce something like this. So what am I actually going to cover in today's presentation? Uh, like the book, I'm focusing on silver and Nielo utilitarian objects, basically everyday objects that were used uh, for members of royalty or members of the, uh, of the uh, art as they were in the 19th century, and also uh, the wealth. Silver, let us not forget, was and remains a precious metal. Uh, I'm not looking at Buddhas or devotional objects. I'm not looking at silver coins, which is a whole different subject on which there have been many uh, 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 books written already. Not hill tribe silver and not armors, uh, armor or weapons, which again, there aren't many that are fully or 100% silver, but there are some parts of armor or weapons that incorporated silver and nearer wear. So, where did Thailand get its silver? Thailand does not have any of its own silver. They don't have silver mines in Thailand. So it all had to be imported in one form or another. Uh, Thai silversmiths typically would melt down Indian rupees, Indo-Chinese piaster, and Chinese coins and ingots. Uh, and that includes the, the Mexican dollar, which was pretty much the, the, uh, the, the coinage of use or universal currency uh, from the 16th to the 19th century across Asia. Um, silver arrived from Bolivia. So much of the silver that we find today in Thailand probably came from Bolivian mines uh, via the via Manila uh, being transported uh, 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 through what is now termed the Silver Road as opposed to the Silk Road, which went across, uh, across uh, uh, Europe and uh, across the Middle East into and Iran, Afghanistan, into, into China. The Silver Road is the, is, it was the term used for the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the maritime route that went from uh, Latin America to the Philippines and then into China and Southeast Asia. A huge amount of silver was transported that way. Uh, as you can see, 220 tons estimated in 17th century. Uh, and so really silver uh, is the first global currency, uh, uh, you know, that, that was used uh, across the world. Thailand uh, was exporting far more goods to China than it was importing. And so it was actually uh, using silver or importing silver to balance its trade deficit with China. And by the 1930s, uh, Thailand was also importing, was, sorry, 1830s, they were importing a huge quantity of, of silver. So that was used, uh, they started to use that to, to make currency specie in the form of bullet coins and later uh, real coins, but a lot of it was also used uh, to produce silver objects. 
And here's a map of the of the silver route and how the uh, the objects actually reached Ayutthaya. Um, and as you can see, they came here from from uh, Bolivia. Some of it went to Spain, but mostly went to Mexico City and then across across the Pacific into Manila and then from Manila by Chinese junk trade, but also by uh, British, Dutch, Portuguese and Spanish uh, uh, ships going to Southeast Asia. And uh, just a huge amount of, 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 of trade in, from the 16th to the 18th century. And how, in what form did that silver take? Well, as I told you, most of it was already in, in the form of the silver dollars, but certainly by the 20th century, uh, the silver that was, was acquired by silversmiths took the form of this kind of, these kinds of pellets, which were acquired um, from silver companies in, com in, in countries like Germany, Switzerland, uh, and Australia. Uh, much of the silver itself comes from Australia and Russia, uh, but uh, historically it would have come from Laos, Burma and Vietnam where there were silver mines. Anyway, I thought you might like to see some, some examples. These pellets were then taken and were melted down into silver ingots. And this is the kind of silver ingot that, that the silversmith stores in his, in his atelier uh, workshop. And then when he's ready to produce some silver, uh, a, a silver object, he takes these uh, silver ingots, melts them down, and then beats a sheet of silver, as, a, as I'll show later, into the object that he wishes to produce. And I say he because nearly all the silversmiths, in fact, I have yet to meet a female silversmith, but all the silversmiths uh, in Thailand were men. So, thing used to take place right across Thailand uh, and every village would have a silversmith and you know any time you entered the village you'd hear the sound of the silversmith beating away on, on, uh, on silver making, making silver. Eventually that evolved, that trade evolved into three main silversmithing centers. Chiang Mai in the north, famed for its lana uh, patterns and forms, Bangkok around Chinatown, and then Nakhon Si Tamarak down in the south, which specialized in the yellowware uh, and used Malay forms and techniques of silversmithing. So um, those are, and as of today, Chiang Mai, uh, Bangkok, and Nakhon Si Tamarak still has a few silversmiths, but really very few compared to 30 years ago. And that's one of the great tragedies of, of um, Thai silverware, that essentially it's become a forgotten, like many art forms, it's become a, for a forgotten art form that uh, is in danger of completely disappearing. Um, I'm going to quickly run through techniques. Um, some of you may be familiar with silverware techniques. Here's a silversmith from Nan, who up in the north of Thailand, who's, who's making uh, I'm not sure what he's making, actually, I can't remember, but this is what he actually made, which is it's the forms that he has built, beaten into some uh, silverware that uh, using these type of small chisels and using this hammer to beat uh, the silver. And as you can see, the silver itself, when he's working it, is, really, is white. Uh, and, and it really only gains its, its sheen, uh, silver sheen, later after he has finished his work and, and has polished it up. So there's no uh, assay office in Thailand in terms of uh, producing silver, but most, of, most silver uh, would, would have been of a minimum 90% purity. Uh, but as I said before, the silver itself would have been provided, that was used by the silversmith, would have been provided by the person commissioning an object. So, so the silversmith had to work with what he was given often. 100% um, silver uh, is too soft and malleable to be used uh, as, a, as an actual object, to be turned into an object. So hence you had to have some copper added. And usually that would be a minimum of 2%, but often it would be 5 or 6%. Um, that you do see some very, very uh, high 
purity silver, 95, 96% um, uh, in objects. All that changed in 1967 when um, uh, silver purity was standardized in Thailand to 92.5. And you see the 925 sign on silver that has been produced from the 60s on. Most of the techniques that, that, that are used in Thailand uh, came here from India. Uh, uh, apart from enameling and filigree work, um, I'm not really talk about filigree work today because uh, mostly it came from um, uh, it came from China, but mostly is used with jewelry rather than utilitarian. Um, uh, uh, today, Nielo uh, came from. Well, it's not sure exactly how it arrived in Thailand, but it, it, we assume that it came uh, from, from Portugal, India, and the Malay world. Um, Nieloware is known uh, from Roman times, um, but it's, it's really unclear today uh, how it arrived, except that obviously uh, it, it was through Nahansi Tamra that it became more famous before being, uh, being uh, produced also in Bangkok. So the first technique that I'll run through is chasing. Um, chasing uh, is, is beating from the outside of the silver object in. Later, we will talk about repousse, which is the opposite, which is beating of the silver from inside out. Now, chasing and repousse uh, were not mutually uh, um, uh, or could be mutually combined in one object. So they, they often find an object where chasing and repousse work uh, go hand in hand. And as you can see, uh, this kind of object here is where the, the, the chasing has been done to beat down into the object. Um, Damascene or inlay, I don't know how many people have been to Toledo in Spain, but Toledo is probably the leading center of, um, of, of Damascene work in Europe. But the word Damascene actually uh, means uh, relating to uh, uh, Damascus work. So this golden lay of silver and gold fine wires into iron objects uh, originally must have come from Damascus but then became quite uh, popular in, in, in Portugal and Spain and then somehow arrived also in Thailand and it's very popular as you can say see with these kind of um, uh, meat gone jock uh, they, they're knives to cut the top knot during the um, during the top knot ceremony when a young man comes of age. Uh, so these are very fine as a very fine example. Uh, you generally see, see Damascene work uh, on on silver objects um, with uh, you know royal arm, arm armor or swords or uh, shields. This kind of work. Enameling is the fusion of a enamel uh, amalgam, um, which is made up of, uh, uh, what is it? It is a, a flint or glass, sand, uh, a metallic, a colored metallic oxide, uh, all fused together at a very high heat. So they're mixed together and then fused onto an object to create a, a colorful, uh, background or design. And you can see here this very fine silver uh, 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 water pot um, which has a tanuaha mark and I'll come back to tanuaha later um, which, which is of a design that was made for the palace because there's a similar example in the Wimanmek palace. And in fact this, this uh, uh, particular object belongs to Nerissa Chapel so I should thank her for allowing me to illustrate it. Engraving is the etching or incising of very fine lines on the door. Uh, not a particularly difficult technique. Uh, and you can see here an example uh, of, a, of a bird amid flowers. 
uh, on silver on a silver object. Uh, gilding is the um, the pretense that an object, a silver object, is in fact a, a, a gold object. So people who couldn't afford to commission a gold object would would in fact uh, uh, go to their silversmith and, and and request a gilded one. Gilding uses real gold, but it is ground down and with mercury, so quite a dangerous thing to do. Uh, and then applied uh, with intense heat to the exterior of the silver object. And here you can see another very fine uh, box, probably to keep beetle or tobacco, uh, also with the Tanya Herma. So very, very much a Chinese design, but made in Thailand for the Thai market. Nero ware is, um, as I've mentioned before, was produced in mostly in Akron Si Tamarat originally, and it is the uh, uh, the production of an amalgam, which is uh, silver, it's a silver, copper, and sulfur uh, um, uh, mixture, and each silversmith would have his own formula of, of, of and is a proprietary formula of producing that amalgam, and then they would uh, uh, sketch a design onto the exterior of the silverware and then apply the amalgam, which would then be heated. The amalgam essentially would burn off, but the black would fuse onto the box and leaving this very attractive uh, kind of gold on black uh, design. And, and I'll come back to Nieloware and some different types of Nieloware later, uh, later in my talk. Open work, as the name suggests, uh, was the production of holes in, a, in an object using very, very fine chisels to create this rather splendid, uh, reticulated uh, 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 object. Again, this is a Chinese design. And repousse work, which I mentioned, is the beating from the inside out of an object. And again, the Lana silversmiths were famed. So that is, when I say Lana, I'm talking about Northern Thailand, but also uh, Myanmar and, and Laos, Northern Laos. They were famed for the exceptional quality of their um, repousse work. And again, it should be no surprise um, that, that that area uh, produced such work because silversmiths were being transported backwards and forwards um, as, you know, as the result of skirmishes, um, uh, one side would gather up silversmiths transport and, and other artisans, transport them across, across to another city where they would remain and those skills would pass down. So um, that is why Lana work is famed for its repousse work. And here's a, a typical example of a, of a repousse uh, a, a bowl that would be used uh, during uh, Buddhist ritual ceremonies. So in terms of usage, <coughs> uh, the silver had become commonly used uh, by the latter half of the Ayutthaya period, mostly for religious ritual and for diplomatic gifts. I mean, again, it was a, pre a, a precious metal. But it became more common, uh, certainly by the Bangkok period. Uh, and uh, members of the of the uh, of the middle class as it developed, uh, so the latter part of the 19th century, they wanted to start using silver as well. However, um, and I should say that uh, that also depended on Bangkok growing and becoming a, a more prosperous city in the la uh, in the latter part of the 19th century. So luxury goods became more popular and more accessible during that time uh, to more people. However, tastes changed by the early, early 20th century. And that was, that was because of a number of factors. In fact, it was almost like a perfect storm leading to the decline. You first of all had the, um, uh, the Great Depression, 1929, which affected Thailand like every other country across the world. So there was just less demand for luxury items. Um, then you had the 1932 coup, which had a major, uh, sorry, not coup, the 1932 revolution, which had a major impact on demand as well, because essentially each member of the aristocracy would have had their own silver and goldsmith, and they would have been producing large, large quantities of silverware um, 
for themselves, but also to reward their own retainers and uh, uh, people in their circles and for giving presents above and below them, their, their, their position. So that, that also led to a decline. And then uh, the, the last thing, of course, is the Second World War, which was uh, probably the death knell uh, for production of silverware for a time. At the same time, uh, the Thai leadership wanted Thailand to civilize, if, if that's the right word, the right word. Uh, it's the word they used. And so essentially chewing of betel nut and taking of snuff also went into decline. And those were, um, you know, a large part of the silverware that was produced were uh, uh, parts of, or constituent parts of, of beetle sets and snuff bottles. So whereas there was a thriving industry in Chiang Mai, Bangkok, 30 to 50 years ago, which catered to the tourism industry. So in the mid, as a result of Vietnam War, the, uh, the industry came back, but mostly producing tourism trinkets. Uh, now there's almost no production uh, in Thailand, which is, which is a very sorry state of affairs. And in fact, a lot of the, 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 the silverware that you see now produced in Thailand, which they say is produced in Thailand, actually has been produced in, in uh, Siem Reap in Cambodia. So, you know, and it's very sad now. I'm sure several of you, many of you are familiar with walking down Walai Street, Silver Street in Chiang Mai. Well, there are some silver shops still there, but essentially no silversmiths anymore uh, uh, producing silver. Um, so just to show that silver was very popular in the uh, early part of the 20th century, here's a picture that I found of a, of a silver shop which I, uh, I reproduced, which I think is, you know, shows you the kind of objects that were sale. You see here uh, silver water pots, uh, uh, bowls, you see some uh, uh, footed trays, uh, and even this rather splendid crown which might have been silver, so, uh, or headdress. Uh, you see silver being advertised, silverwares being advertised uh, in, in jewellery shops that were under royal patronage. Here's F. Gralat & Co, uh, who was a German uh, jeweller who produced uh, uh, jewellery for King Chula Longcorn and his court. Uh, and you can see here, uh, silver made for European taste, a European style goblet made in silver, uh, a, a European style tray and a, a tea set. And I, I rather like this picture of the splendid, very content uh, gentleman, appears to be in uh, Northern Thailand because of the nature of the silverware, most of which appears to be Lana style uh, 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 silverware. And again, he is very happy and satisfied with the collection that he's built. But it shows you that, that these were objects that were being acquired for use at that time. And again, silverware was used mostly by members of the royal family. Um, the king would give out gold to high uh, mem objects made of gold uh, to the highest members of, 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 of royalty, but to other members of the nobility or to people that he was rewarding at court, he would give objects uh, uh, made of silver. And here, this is Queen Sunanta, uh, who, who passed away in 1880, tragically, and uh, uh, um, drowned on her way to Bang Pa Inn. Um, she, here is a selection of raw regalia, uh, some of which may be gold, but this I believe is a, a Niello Ware spittoon, and I think this is also uh, Niello Ware uh, as well. But you can see this is late 19th century, but by the uh, 1960s, here again, uh, uh, Queen Sirikit also having her own set of regalia, you know, prominently displayed in a, in a royal portrait taken at the Grand Palace. And again, uh, this, it would, it's very common for yellowware and silverware to be used to display somebody's rank, uh, to display the fact that they, hello, I've got this, um, uh, you know, no Hermes bag, but uh, the right uh, level of royal regalia. And silverware was commonly used in religious ritual. So again, 
these kinds of, of pan, uh, very, um, very large uh, uh, trays, footed trays uh, that were used uh, to present uh, uh, gifts or, or food um, uh, items to, to the monks in, uh, uh, during a temple ceremony. And here, uh, a, a, uh, a water bowl with a water dipper that would have been used uh, uh, to hold lustral water during a temple ceremony as well. So silver was the, uh, was the precious metal of choice uh, because gold would not have been used during temple ceremonies. Uh, but it was, it was accept, deemed acceptable for monks to use silver, certainly monks at the, at the royal temples. And here are, here are some of the, the examples of, uh, of, of, of beetle sets. Um, so um, when I first started thinking about how to write the book, originally I was going to divide um, you know, silverwares into, from the north, northeast, uh, central plains and the south. But that seemed to then become too difficult to try to separate. There's too much overlapping. So in the end, I, I decided not to do that, but I do include examples of each type. And for instance, um, there are many regional varieties of beetle set. Um, this one is a very fine um, southern uh, beetle set. Uh, this one is a more typical Chinese style with this uh, lovely rabbit design on the top. Uh, and this is from the north and again uh, has these kind of worlds representing the Buddhist's hair, Buddha's hair on the top uh, and, and around, the, uh, around the, um, uh, the deep bowl. And um, for those of you that are, that are on Instagram, I, I, am, uh, I have an Instagram uh, silver page and I post every Friday a different type of beetle set, which seems to be quite popular. Uh, I think I've done about uh, 10, 10 or 12 so far. I've probably got about another month or two of uh, different uh, varieties of beetle set. But these were you know, made in huge numbers, huge quantities. Going on to snuff paraphernalia, um, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with Thai snuff bottles, but in Thailand, Thailand was the only uh, place in the world that used this kind of U-shaped sniffer to inhale snuff. So one end you uh, put in your mouth, the other, you first of all gather some snuff up into, into the end that's going into your, into your nose, and then the other into your, to your mouth, and you, you blew, uh, so yes, you, you blew up into your nose. So very hygienic, but very, very, very unusual. Um, Here's a selection of the types of uh, Thai snuff bottle, uh, silver snuff bottles that were made. But again, a huge variety of different snuff bottles. Most of these would have had also a, a, a spoon attached to the stopper to, to uh, put the snuff into the, uh, into the uh, end of the uh, sniffer. Oops, hold on. Oops, I missed one. Uh, here are some tea accessories. Um, again, uh, the, the art of collecting tea sets and of drinking tea grew in popularity throughout the 19th century so that by the end of the 19th century it was very common to have uh, uh, for, for King Trulongkorn to host uh, tea set competitions where tea sets, you know, members of the nobility would display their tea sets uh, on Sunam Luang opposite the royal palace. Um, this is a typical type of tea set set on, on, on a silver tray. And the silver trays actually became works of art in their own right and uh, are very, very collectible now in, in Thailand. Uh, again, uh, people like to try to match the designs on the tea sets to the designs on the tea tray. Um, this bucket, which most people think is, a, is an ice bucket, is actually a teapot warmer. So um, you would have thick cotton wadding uh, in, into which uh, an Yixing teapot would be deposited to keep it warm once water had been poured into it. This is not a kettle, uh, but is in fact a water pot. These are both water pots uh, into which boiling water uh, would be poured. Uh, silver retains heat very well and 
then the uh, the hot water would be poured into the uh, into the Yixing teapot uh, when uh, when it was ready to to brew up a new batch of tea. So uh, tea tea accessories became extremely popular uh, in silver, as they did in many other uh, materials, including porcelain. Fashion accessories. So walking sticks became very fashionable, uh, again, as part of the idea of uh, civilizing uh, uh, Thai society. Uh, uh, many Western fashions were adopted, including the use of silver topped uh, walking sticks. And here are some examples. I particularly like this one with the elephant, uh, the silver elephant head with actually pink gold uh, tusks. But there are many, many different varieties. Parties of, of walking stick and handbag. Uh, these, this is a particularly fine uh, silver woven handbag uh, that was produced, I would say, in central Thailand, probably early 20th century. Again, very popular and very elegant. And there are a number of Niello uh, handbags and, and, and wallets as well that became very, very popular. Um, as I mentioned, it's before, there, there was no assay office, so no mark, mark, official mark on silverware in Thailand. So in, it's incredibly difficult and, and remains difficult to actually date a piece of Thai silver. All we can do is look at the following factors. The form, the design, and the motif. Similar objects with a known date, and in particular, uh, diplomatic or royal gifts where we do have a date. There are a number of gifts that were, were given um, uh, to by the King of Thailand to presidents uh, of the United States in the mid 1850s and the early 1870s um, and also royal and family insignia that are placed on an object such as um, and I'll show you later Queen Sunanta's insignia and uh, or the Bunag family insignia. Uh, these were not common, but they were ordered um, or, or from uh, uh, Chinese silversmiths based in Bangkok. There were also Chinese chop marks on items produced in that 70 year period around the, the, the turn of the 20th century. And they often included the name of the silversmith. They would, they would often have in Chinese Wen Yin, Zhu Yin, Zheng Yin, which means or, uh, you know, full silver or standard silver um, or silver purity. They would, they would identify silver purity even if they weren't very accurate. And there would also be a name. And that name would often be the name of the silversmith, but it might have been the name of the atelier or factory, or maybe it would have been the name of the retail outlet that had ordered it. Um, it's very unclear and still not known uh, exactly uh, the extent to which uh, the, 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 the mark belonged to the atelier or the retail outlet. Since I wrote the book, I was contacted by uh, a lady, a Thai lady, whose father set up the Hershing uh, Atelier. And she told me that it was definitely that mark belonged to their factory, not the silversmith. And that, uh, that factory was still producing silverware as recently as 10 years ago. Um, I'm going to quickly now turn to Nieloware. Nieloware is such an important subset of Thai silverware. Um, it's not really known outside of Thailand. Yes, there is Nieloware uh, in uh, Portugal and Spain, but more so, I would say, in Russia and in Iran. But for some reason, it's, it's really little known outside of Thailand Thai, and the high standard of Thai silver. Uh, what I'm presenting to you here is a magnificent uh, uh, Nielo bowl, probably Rama three period, so early to mid 19th century, that belongs to uh, Nerissa Chakrabong and is in her family home in Bangkok completely unique and has these wonderful elephant handles. Uh, and if you can, I don't have a picture here, but in my book I do. If you can see the elephant head on, they have, it has wonderful legs coming down uh, uh, underneath. So a lot of thought went into the design and artwork. 
this um, takes about three or four people to lift up uh, and is incredibly heavy. Wonderful, wonderful object. So, as I told you before, uh, Nieloware was de de defined by the Silver Association of Thailand. The manner of making receptacles by means of the application of a lead amalgam superimposed or upon or per poured into inside incised designs. We don't know exactly when it when it first arrived in Thailand, but there's a long history here, dating back to probably around or just slightly before the 13th century. The first recorded mention, uh, oops, sorry is in the 15th century royal laws, where it talks about um, basically only a nobleman uh, with certain uh, wealth, level of wealth, uh, was in a position to own a, a nearware uh, 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 set. Uh, so this shows, gives you an idea of the value of Nielo, even dating back to kind of early Ayutthaya period. And there are many different types of nieloware. Um, I, in my book, I give a full list, but the most common is this, what used to be called gold nieloware. Um, but as I say, as I show, explain here, it's really a misnomer to call it gold nieloware because um, there is, there is, uh, there are believed to be, although I have yet to see one, some examples of nieloed gold. So a gold object that has then had a niello applied to it. Um, this gilded, what I've called gilded silver niello ware, is really a silver object covered with an all-over gold design, which the uh, amalgam fills in the gaps. This became most popular in the mid 19th century. Um, prior to that, um, what what is called black niello ware. Um, is really more popular, where more of the object was 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 covered in the amalgam, and that because I guess gold was probably even more expensive then, or maybe it was more rare. Here's the other more common uh, type of nieloware, silver nieloware, which certainly by the early 20th century uh, probably became the most common type of nieloware. Uh, again, probably because it became uh, uh, more affordable to more people and was cheaper than gold. Uh, again, note that the all over desi silver design, and you can see the black amalgam between the, between the silver designs here. Um, there are many uh, uh, forms and patterns of, of Thai nieloware uh, that are similar to other silverware, but what you do see in nieloware are examples of foreign influence. Uh, mostly with Indian bidri ware and some Persian nielo ware. And as I said, these, are pro these probably came with uh, Portuguese or Indian trade traders via Persia and then up through Naponsi Tamara. Um, and to show you some examples, uh, so you can compare for yourselves, uh, here you have uh, some Indian bidri ware on the left and on the right a very fine uh, nielo bottle which comes from the VNA collection uh, and you can see um, they're really quite similar just in the shape of the, the bottle this one doesn't have a stopper and this does but very similar in, in influence here again is a, a, a bidri water bottle uh, and a and a, uh, a gilded silver niello, niello water pot and again here you can see very similar a Thai niello uh, a cigarette box, and you can see this kind of influence of the Persian silver niello cigarette box here. So there can be little doubt that Persian, uh, the Persian influence on, on Thai niello ware, as as it as there was on other art forms as well. Uh, originally, niello was really only available to members of the royal family and nobility, and uh, uh, but as I said before, a long documented history uh, of, of Nielo uh, gifts. Um, and again, that is really how I was able to date uh, many of the Nielo ware in my pieces of Nielo ware in my book um, through these overseas gifts. 
Uh, I wanted to, to illustrate this particular uh, uh, gilded silver and yellow water pot simply because it has such a rare design of elephants foraging in a forest, which I think is quite charming. It also is an identical shape uh, of an example given by King Rama IV uh, in the 1850s. So again, we can, we can, we can uh, uh, date it to, to, to that time. And just to show a piece of mo modern yellowware that was made in Nakhon Si Tamarad in, in 2014, this is a, an incredibly large uh, gilded silver yellow bowl, offering bowl on a, with a matching spoon and, and stand. And just to give you an idea of, of cost, uh, this cost uh, around about 300,000 baht in, in 2018, I went to Nakhon Si because the amount of gold involved, and 300,000 baht, I guess, is about uh, uh, 10,000 US dollars, um, 7,000 um, pounds, uh, dating to, to, you know, 2018, because the price of gold had gone up. So no wonder, again, Nyerawere is not really in demand at the moment, and there are only 10 households. Uh, you know, as of that time, that were really producing Nyerawes, um, which was down si significantly from about 50 to 100, you know, 30 years before. Um, I just want to show Chinese influence, which, which gained traction in all aspects of Thai art uh, through the 19th century, but in particular in uh, Thai silverware. Uh, and, and basically, as Thai, uh, Chinese silversmiths uh, uh, entered Bangkok, they started to predominate, and they were known as, the work they produced was known as Shanghai work. Um, not necessarily because they became, they came from Shanghai, but because of the influence of the work, and that it was presumed that Shanghai work was good. Here's an example with, an, uh, with a, a Da Xing mark, Thai design, but with Chinese influence and marks. Here's a, a, a water bottle from the Asian Civilization Museum collection. Again, Thai form, but very much uh, uh, Chinese design. And uh, this, I want to just show you the final uh, object because we're running out of time, but is the it has the Tanya Her mark, but this fantastic water pot, which uh, uh, a friend of mine found in Buenos Aires, I'm very happy to say has got this Marc Palais de Siam, uh, Exposition de uh, Universelle, Paris, uh, 1889, uh, which was a huge exposition to which 32 million people uh, visited between May and October 1889. Clearly, this was made and, dis uh, and, and uh, uh, displayed at the Thai Pavilion. This is a picture of the Thai Pavilion. Uh, so it would have been made in Bangkok in 1888 by the Tanya He Atelier. And I call Tanya He the Cartier of Bangkok because every single piece of silverware that I've found, um, such as this wonderful uh, footed stand with, with inset gems, and this is silver gilt, um, you know, is, is of a very, very high standard. Here are a pair of silver gilt, silver snuff bottles with Queen Sunanta's um, uh, insignia, royal insignia. So again, has to be dated to eight, before 1880 uh, with a tenure her mark. And the last piece uh, is a Thai water pot, again, made uh, for royalty, a similar one in the Women Mech Palace collection, again with the tenure her mark, must have been made in Thailand uh, rather than ordered from China. I've run out of time. Uh, there's much more to be said. I'm very happy to, to answer questions and thank you very much for uh, your attention today. Well, th thank you very much, Paul. I mean, that's a, that was a fascinating uh, account on, on the history and it's a shame this isn't still going on today, but I can understand the, the reasons why, why that's not happening. And uh, I hope people aren't cashing their they're, they're Thai silver in today in, in this sort of economic hardship because uh, all you get for it today is the weight of the silver. You don't, you don't get the, the value of, 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 the, of the products themselves. Um, but i leave Andrew to see if anyone's got any questions because you've, you've covered a whole lot of areas and uh, it was a fascinating account from start to finish. So has, has anyone got any questions for Paul? 
can I either raise your hand or, or use the, uh, the box in your corner to, 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 to notify putting your hand up? Trevor has a question. Trevor? Go ahead. You'll have to unmute, Trevor. Sorry, cannot hear you. Yeah, I think he's muted, Paul, unfortunately. Okay. Trevor, have you got a question? No. It's not coming through. Is he? Hello. I think Chris, 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 you can hear me Chris now, can you? Yes, right. go ahead, Trevor. Go right. Ahead. It, it was really relating to the um, the, the, the assay co comment that you made. I, I understand, obviously, there's no um, equivalent in, in Thailand, but is there any form of agency that in, in some way, um, super, well, I say supervise, not the right word, but um, coordinates uh, and, and, if you like, looks at the whole sort of area in, in, of, of this where, and, and in some way, I mean, is, is, is having a controlling influence? Although, as what you were saying is, it's now very much on the decline. Or is it all just up to individual manufacturers? Um, there, there, uh, after the 1960s, uh, there was the Thai Silver and Yellowware Association. So they, they basically regulated the industry. But, I, you know, it being Thailand, I don't think the regulation was very strict. And, um, you know, th th but there were guidelines for sure. And uh, certainly the association had meetings. They published books. Um, so there, 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 there was that association. And that association does still exist. I believe they've still got a web they, they have a website. I'm not, I'm not sure how active they are now. Thank you. Steve, Chris and Nigel both have their hands. Yeah, I can see Chris. Chris, go ahead. I yeah. saw your hand up. Okay, th thank you very much. And can I just say that was really fascinating. Uh, Paul and, and, and Steve for organizing this, Andrew for organizing this. It's really interesting. But, uh, what, what I was going to ask is, given that we're not going to be over in Thailand until le next year, um, are there any places in the UK where you can go and have in museums or uh, collections where you can go and have a look at, at Nilla Ware or Silverware, you know, the British Museum or the V&A or, or, or something like that? Um, the V&A does have one cabinet um, where sometimes they have some silverware and yellowware. They actually have some lovely pieces, but they're all uh, put away in storage. So um, that's the problem. The British Museum has no, to its shame, uh, has no Southeast Asian art really on display since they, you know, just have the uh, China with a little bit of Japanese and Korean and, and the Indian galleries. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to find uh, in the UK. The best place to go is probably France. If you go to the Fontainebleau Palace, they have um, their Chinese palace which he, and there is quite a lot of yellowware on display there because um the, the uh, uh king chulon called sent some presents to napoleon the third so that that's probably the best collection that i've seen um the, the other place which i haven't been to which if you fancy a holiday is supposed to be fantastic <laughs> is a, a museum in sardinia uh, which where uh, there, there was a, a, a chap, I'm trying to remember his name now, um, who, who lived in Thailand. He was, an, he was an architect or engineer, lived in Thailand for 30 years, uh, 1880s to early 20th century. And he went back to Sardinia and set up a, a wonderful museum. That's, uh, thanks very much. It's very interesting. And I'm intrigued about the British Museum having those Southeast Asia um, objects. I, I wasn't aware of that. It's very interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't find them, but maybe they're hidden <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I think it's I think shameful. <coughs> well, it is, yeah. My point of view. Nigel, have you got a question uh, for yeah. Paul? Um, well, Seth, thank you. Uh, very interesting talk. And certainly those snuff tubes are completely new to me. Um, quite amazing. Um, but in the, certainly in the Western world, the reason that um, so much old silver um, got melted down and remade was because the silver was very expensive and the labour was incredibly cheap. 
So in 1750, you know, fashions changed. So you melted down your silver and were charged um, a shilling or one and sixpence an ounce to have it remade. That, of course, has now completely changed and the silver is relatively cheap and the labour is hugely expensive, so that doesn't happen. But were the, did, were the economics the same in Thailand? Um, I think silver's always been the expensive component, really. Um, uh, so people were melting down their silver. Well, first of all, people did two things with silver and gold. They, they accumulated a lot of it if they, if they had money, and often they would just bury it because it was safe, they felt it was safer to do that than, than keep, it in a, you know, keep money in a bank. Um, so, and they would dig it up when they needed some, some, some money. Um, but typically people uh, would invest in gold and silver to a lesser degree, uh, and they still do now. The, 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 uh, just yesterday, there were huge queues uh, uh, at gold shops outside Ch in Chinatown um, because people wanted to buy gold because it had fallen so much over the last few weeks. And so they see it as a, as a better place to store wealth uh, than, than in a bank. And I think that's been the case. People, uh, people, you know, they fall on hard times, sell the silver. Uh, or you want, to, you want to create a new silver gift for another member of the family, melt down an object you don't like anymore. But I, I think that the, the labor, relatively speaking, has always been fairly cheap here uh, and remains fairly cheap compared to the, the price of the metal. Thank you. The other thing I would like to say is that it's a bit of a myth that um, nine, that pure silver, or no, well, nine 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 silver, is too soft. I mean, uh, uh, providing it's made of a good gauge, I've got a nine 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 silver tumbler cup, and it's fine. So it, it 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 is a bit of a myth that it's too soft. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Could, I, 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 did you have a question? <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Well, I wondered if there was anything about Paul's career that led him to develop an interest in Thai silver. You know how how it originally started. Okay, so I have a I had a fairly interesting and diverse career as a corporate investigator. I, so I I worked in corporate investigations. So I'm a sinologist by background. Okay, I studied right. Lee, and then. Um, I fell into corporate investigations. I answered an ad in the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong in 1988 uh, with this company called Kroll that was setting up in Hong Kong. Loved it, uh, did it for 32 years and spent most of my time uh, doing uh, corporate investigations. Maybe those skills helped me with my research, but there was no real overlap. Um, we started collecting antiques, uh, I think in the mid 90s when we could afford to. And uh, then when we moved to Thailand in the end of 97, uh, we started uh, collecting more, more formally, I would say. And uh, silver was later on, the, on my list. So I started collecting Ben Jerong first. And then my wife had always loved the Thai silverware. And yeah. so she was the one that kind of pushed me to uh, understand and appreciate Thai silver, I would say. Yeah, lovely to see. The, the, the research skills came in very handy for, for doing the book, but also having the knowledge of Chinese and being able to read Chinese, mm. I think, even though I, my spoken Chinese is not very good now, but having that knowledge, I think, helped in being able to compile the compendium at the back of the book. And if we do do a second edition, I've also now got probably another 10 or 15 and marks that I would add in there as well, plus some other information. So, you know, I'm hopeful that maybe in another year or two, uh, we'll do a second edition, but then we also have, we'll also do uh, a lot more examples. There have to be a lot more new, uh, new examples of different silverware. No, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's interesting, Paul, when I lived in Malaysia at the end of uh, 96 to, the, to 2000, pewter was a big thing in, in, in Malaysia, uh, Selangor, Pewter, for example, did, 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 did pewter ever come into Thailand? Was that was that ever get, get to not, any, any any volume? Not not as far as I'm aware. But if it was going to, it would be in the south, like it's in yes, in, uh, near, 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 near the border. Tin, but I'm yeah. not from. I yeah, no, that, that was that was the reason from from from, from Malaysia using using it. 
Any, yes. any more questions for, for Paul? Just one uh, little bit. Uh, just Please. Listen to you and photograph. You remind me of some of the uh, lacquerware and nettleware my mother have. Um, I was put in a box under the cupboard. Now I have to go and have a look at it now. <laughs> she had a bit of place as well with a silver, with a diamond, uh, with a jewelry around. And a lot of things that she had with, from her mother uh, in a box. Now I have to go and open up and have to start looking and polish it again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, and I, I, I'd love to see your, your pictures. We, we're, we're always looking for more. Just photos. Just the photos of your book. Yeah. There we are. We got there. <laughs> and I should take some photos of my mother's uh, stuff and then probably pass on to you if any yeah. interest. Please do. I would be delighted to see them. Yeah, we'll do that. It, it would be interesting, Paul, to sort of uh, Thai embassies around the world. I mean, particularly Thai embassy here in the UK whether that's got some Thai silver and some Thai nila ware in, in a cupboard somewhere or ho hopefully out on display because that's the sort of place where you would imagine um, that's been there for a number of years. You never know where you're going to find these things. Absolutely. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the ring collection of Ben Jurong in, in Oslo. Um, you know, this uh, collection of, of Ben Jurong had been sitting in two separate museums in Oslo for about 80, well, that actually must have been uh, uh, 100 years, almost 100 years um, before they were discovered. And so um, you never know what will come to light. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, I hope some more examples do come to light because I think uh, you, you've gone into a great deal of trouble to sort of highlight this as an area which I think very few people otherwise would, would have been aware of. And I think uh, I'd just say thank, thank you very much for sharing your, 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 your I think research you with us today. I think Nigel has it, wants to come back. Oh, no, uh, please, by, by any, anyone else, please. No, Nigel, come back in. Um, we well, got no, the book I, of Ben Jerong as well here. I think possibly my hand was still up, but um, I have um, very good friends in both the V&A and the British Museum curators. I will make inquiries, and if they back mm. do have stuff hidden away, I'll, uh, I'll let you know. Yeah, the V&A oh. in particular, because I, for the book, I was taken down into the storage. And, and it's in um, Olympia, but they were going to move. Yeah, they, the, um, gov the government, unfortunately, both the V&A and the Science Museum had huge collection. Yeah. In, in some cases, nas the National Collection, V&A National Theatre Collection in Blythe House in Olympia. And the government, in its usual crass-handed way, has decided they can make some money out of facts. So they're moving somewhere down into South London, but nobody's really quite certain what's happening. Well, if you can get into that Blythe house before they move, highly uh, recommend it. The stuff, it's, will it's, still, the stuff will certainly be, a, be, be accessible if you know the right people. Yeah. yeah. Well, they've got some beautiful examples there. And uh, I only have one piece, I think, which I illustrated in the book, but they have a number, I would say maybe between 10 and 20 very beautiful examples of Thai silver and a few pieces and, uh, you know, other pieces that are just average, but some really beautiful examples. Normally, all, virtually all the V&A objects are now accessible on the web with downloadable pictures. Oh, okay. That um, was not the case a few years ago. But no, if... but um, they, they are all, uh, virtually every object is now on the web and is downloadable. And if you know how to delve into the system, they can even be downloaded in high quality. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's good to know. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Any, any more questions for Paul? If, if, if not, Paul, I'd just say thank you once again i mean it really really has been very good of you to give up your time but i mean i think we've all enjoyed enjoyed uh, your presentation thank just you. before everyone goes and thank, thank you for everybody else for for tuning in this morning um just the the, the, the next few uh, talking thailand events the next one is on wednesday the 17th of march with dr Pisanti, who as as, as as most people will know has given very Two, two very good uh, presentations on, on, on how Thailand has dealt with the, uh, uh, fr fr from a medical perspective, how, how Thailand has dealt with the, uh, the, the COVID pandemic. And talking to Paul earlier, I don't know if anybody else in the conversation, Paul was saying the Thailand vaccination 
program has just started on in a very small way, but hopefully that will build up speed like our own program, because I think 